So, good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to this uh, lecture with the uh, Nobel laureate and Harvard professor, uh, Eric Maskin. Uh, this lecture is part of an initiative that we from the Nobel Foundation has been running uh, for a few years uh, that we call the Nobel Prize Inspiration Initiative. And, and one of the reasons for us doing this is, of course, to get as many people as possible to listen to fantastic scholars uh, and fantastic lectures. Uh, but another very important reasons, reason for us doing this is that we want to see this as a kind of a celebration for the importance of education and importance of, of science. Uh, and that, that is something that we find extremely important to try to do whatever we can do to promote that, that idea. Uh, and the way we have gotten to know the FGV during the last, last couple of days, we really feel that we share the same values with, with the FGV. So we from Nobel are very uh, grateful um, and happy uh, to do this in, in partnership with, with the FGV. Uh, we would also like to thank uh, a few Swedish companies that has made this initiative possible. It's uh, Scania, it's uh, Saab, it's Sandvik, Ericsson and, and Volvo. And I think it's fair to say that all those, those companies also share a passion for knowledge and, and science and education, uh, which is so important for, uh, for all of us. So uh, once again, thank you very much for coming here and thank you so much for having us here uh, today. And with that, I would like to hand over the microphone to uh, Rubens uh, Sisne. Uh, we'll introduce uh, Professor Maskin in a proper way. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to all the sponsors, to Professor Maskin, to the, Nash to the Academy, uh, to the Nobel Foundation. Today is one of those days, I hope, in which we get away above ourselves. Because we, we are here not only to listen to the message which is going to be conveyed to all of you. But actually, I could say, uh, thinking of an ideal, which is the ideal of education and of science, or of scientific education. It's a matter of great privilege for us to establish, as I said, not only the message that's going to be passed to all of you regarding mechanism design, but to be hosting this type of ritual, a ritual which is, has as its main purposes to disseminate how important it is for our city, for our state, for all of us in academia, those who are not in academia as well, and for our country and for the world as a whole to understand that we have to think but observe the facts and how they fit to the things that we have pre-thought. Yesterday we talked about globalization but from a different perspective, talked from the perspective of income inequality. Today, uh, in this talk about mechanism design, one of the things that I think we should be aware is that, for sure, this, which is called the engineering of economics, is going to be, in my view, of utmost importance in the years to come. And that is because of globalization. Sometime apart from now, I don't know if in 20, 40, or 240 years, we are going to have to rely very much on a mechanism to do something that is going to be decisive for us. Convincing sovereign nations 
and this convincing process will have foreign nations as well, by nations um, somehow are not to be convinced of doing things by force, but by persuasion and negotiation. So upon that is go certainly to depend our natural equilibrium. And I think mechanism design is going to be the, a great contribution from social sciences to solve problems of sovereign nations having to convince more and more sovereign nations about things which have to be done. We'll have to come up with devices that allow these negotiations to be very fruitful. And this is, I think, one of the, it's going to be one of the most important among several others that Professor Maskin is going to talk about today of mechanism design. Said that, let me make the formal introduction of Professor Eric Maskin. Professor Eric Maskin is a Adams University professor at the University of Harvard. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics from the University of Harvard in 1972, a Master of, of Arts in Applied Mathematics, also from Harvard University in 1974, and a PhD in Applied Mathematics as well from Harvard University in 1976. He has had several academic positions through his academic life, is nowadays a visiting professor at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology as of 2010, and also, as I said, the Adams University professor at Harvard University. He holds several, of, several fellowships, grants, and awards, uh, honorary degrees as well, honorary professorships, for instance, at the Tsinghua University in 2000, 2007, St. Petersburg University of Management and Economics in 2000, 2012, among several other distinctions. He is a member also of the National Academy of Science of the British Academy of Sciences, National Academy of the United States, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the Spanish Academy, fellow from the Econometric Society since 1981, and also a member and a fellow of the European Economic Association. So, let me brief and pass the floor to Professor Eric Maskin, please. Thank you so much, Rubens, for that lovely introduction. Thanks to all of you for coming out and squeezing into this room. I hope it doesn't get too warm. Uh, uh, many thanks to FGV for, for hosting this event and to the people from Nobel Media for setting it up, the sponsors for paying for it. Uh, I'd like to spend some time this morning talking about a subject that I've devoted a lot of my career to, mechanism design. Uh, probably some of you um, already know a bit about this subject. Uh, Rubens told me that there are some, uh, some really pretty advanced students here, but I'm not going to assume that you, uh, that you know anything about the subject. What I'll do is I'll first give you a, a very brief definition, a uh, one-paragraph definition of mechanism design. Uh, but if you're anything like me, formal definitions don't really mean very much. They're a little bit too abstract to, to, uh, to be useful. So almost immediately, I'm going to go to a set of examples where you will see in rather concrete terms uh, what mechanism design is, what it's trying to accomplish. And I hope that through the examples you will uh, appreciate what uh, I've been doing most of my career. But 
let me start with, with the definition. And as Ruben suggested, there is a close tie, in, in my view, between mechanism design and engineering. In fact, I like to think of mechanism design as the engineering part of economic theory. So what do I mean by that? Well, a lot of times, a lot of times in economics, in fact, probably most of the time, uh, what we do is to examine existing economic institutions. And what we want to know is what, what outcomes those institutions uh, will generate. We try to predict the outcomes, or we look back on outcomes that have already happened, and we try to explain those outcomes. And this is a very important part of economics. It, I, I think it's about 90% of what most economists do. Uh, it's called the positive or predictive part of the subject. But what I like to do is just the opposite. In, in, in mechanism design, we reverse the direction. That is, we, we start with the outcomes. We, we, we first say, these are the outcomes we would like to have. Those are our goals. And then we work backwards to try to figure out if we could design institutions, mechanisms, that would achieve the outcomes that that we would like to achieve. And uh, if that's possible to do, we want to know what form those institutions or mechanisms might take. So this is still a minority part of economics. I, it's a growing minority, and, and for good reasons, which we will be coming to, uh, but still a minority part of economics. It, it's the normative or prescriptive part of economics, and it's the part of the subject that is dearest to my heart, and I hope uh, to persuade some of you that you might like it too. So with, without further ado, let me go to the, to the first example. And it's an example which you might not think of as the most important issue in the world, uh, but it's an example which is probably familiar to you from your own home experience. I think mo most people have faced the problem I'm about to talk, uh, talk about in their, in their own family. Uh, here, here's the problem. Let's imagine that you're a parent, a mother, and you have a cake that you want to divide between your, your two children, Alice and Bob. And your goal in dividing this cake is that each child should be happy with the piece that he or she has got. Uh, that means that Bob should think that he's got at least half the cake, and Alice should think that she's got at least half the cake. And if we achieve, if the mother achieves this goal, we'll, we'll say that we have a fair division of the cake. Well, uh, if your family is anything like mine, it is absolutely disastrous if you don't achieve a fair division. So again, this may not be regarded as the most important problem in the world, but it may be the most important problem for the family. <laughs> So how, do we, how does the mother accomplish this? Well, if, she, if the mother is confident that she knows how the kids view the cake, that they view the cake the same way that she does, then there's a very simple way of getting to a fair division. What the mother can do is take a knife and cut the cake exactly in half, in her, in her view, and give each kid half the cake. And because the kids see the cake the same way that the mother does, each child realizes that he or she has half the cake, and, and that's the end of the story. That solves the problem. 
The trouble, of course, is that children almost never see things the way their parents do. Uh, so what if Bob sees the cake differently from his mother? Well, this, this is probably the likely scenario. Uh, she thinks she's cut it exactly in half, but he thinks Alice's piece is bigger. In fact, it's entirely possible that, Al that Bob thinks Alice's piece is bigger and that Alice thinks Bob's piece is bigger. That's a, there, there's no reason why that can't happen at the same time. In fact, it usually does happen at the same time. So, so here's the problem. Uh, the mother wants to achieve a fair division, but she doesn't have enough information to do this. She, 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 in effect, doesn't know what division is fair because she doesn't know how the children see the cake. And so the mechanism design problem is, despite not having this critical information, is it possible for her to design a mechanism, a procedure, to, that will result in a fair division, even though she doesn't know what's fair herself? Well, it, it turns out that this problem is, is very old. Uh, it, it's literally thousands of years old. Uh, it's, it's described in, in the Bible. It's described in the Old Testament, uh, not in terms of cake, but there's a passage where Lot and Abraham are discussing the division of grazing land between them. And they want a fair division of the grazing land. So, so uh, it's equivalent to the cake problem. And just as, the, um, just as the Bible states the problem, it also provides a beautiful solution. Uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you what the solution is. It's extremely simple. It's the sort of thing that, if you didn't already know it, you would say, that I should have seen that already. Uh, but it's extremely clever. Um, so s simplicity can sometimes disguise uh, a great deal of ingenuity. And, and, and here's, here's how to solve the problem. Uh, perhaps you, you have done this in your own family. Uh, one of the children. Bob, say, should cut the cake. So, so uh, Bob cuts the cake in two. And then the other child, Alice, chooses which piece she takes for herself. So I claim that this mechanism solves the problem. And why does it work? It works because when Bob is cutting the cake, he has a strong incentive to divide it so that, in his eyes, the two pieces are exactly equal. Why? Because if one of them is bigger, he knows Alice is going to take that one. She gets to choose, and he'll be stuck with a smaller one. So he will try to cut the cake so that whichever piece Alice takes, he's happy with the other one. So Bob will be happy, and Alice will be happy because she gets to choose her favorite piece. And, and so the mechanism works. Very, very simple, uh, but as I said, quite devilishly clever. And this humble cake division problem humble though it is, it is already rich enough to illustrate some of the key features of mechanism design. So, so uh, as I've emphasized, the mechanism designer, who is the mother in this case, doesn't have enough information to know in advance what outcomes are optimal. She doesn't know 
what outcomes are, are fair. Uh, and that means that she can't do the allocation herself. She has to go to get to an allocation indirectly through this mechanism. The mechanism uh, in the cake example is the divide and choose procedure. You, you, you can think of it as the participants themselves, Alice and Bob, generating the information needed to determine a, an optimal outcome by their very participation in the, in the mechanism. But there's, there's a complication uh, when it comes to mechanism design. The complication is that there's that the participants need not share the same goals as the mechanism designer. In this case, the mechanism designer uh, wanted a fair division. Bob and Alice don't care about a fair division. They just want more cake. So their objectives are not necessarily the same as the mother. In general, they won't be the same. And so the mechanism designer has to take that into account when designing the mechanism. So very simple story, cake division, but it's already um, sufficiently rich to illustrate some of the important themes of, of mechanism design. I, I, in particular, to use the jargon of mechanism design, the mechanism has to be incentive compatible. It has to be compatible with Alice and Bob's objectives. Okay, so, so that's my first example. Um, let's move on to an example uh, of bigger scope. And this next example is, is actually literally of global scope. Uh, and it has to do with the, with the privatization of the radio spectrum that we've seen in many, many countries, uh, including Brazil, including the United States, uh, over the last 20 years. <coughs> 20 years ago, uh, the radio spectrum was essentially in most countries by the government. And that meant that there was a valuable resource, the, uh, uh, the, the right to transmit on these radio frequencies going more or less to waste. I mean, of course, radio frequencies were used for radio and TV, a few other police communication, but uh, by and large, most of it was just sitting there unused. And governments recognized that this was an inefficient state of affairs. And they decided to, to privatize. In other words, to start uh, transferring the right to broadcast on different bands of radio frequencies to the private sector, to telecom companies who would make more efficient use of this spectrum. And that's exactly what they did. And that, and that privatization made possible a communications revolution. The, the, uh, the mobile phones, the smartphones, the, the, uh, the, the satellite TV, the, all of the modern miracles that we enjoy today were made possible by this, uh, by this transfer of resources from the public to the private sector uh, starting in the mid-90s. Well, let, uh, let's look at a particular example of, the, of uh, this sort of transfer. Let, let's look at a government that wants to uh, Tra transfer a license for a particular band of frequencies to one of several telecom companies who are interested in this license. 
And what the government would like to do, because this is the main point of privatization, is to put the license in the hands of the company uh, that values it the most. That, uh, that this is the efficient outcome. That company is the one who is likely to create the most value for society because it, it, it finds the license the most precious. The difficulty is that the government doesn't know which company values the license the most. So it doesn't know what the efficient outcome is. Very similar to the, to the cake problem. Well, what can it do? The, the most straightforward thing would be for the government to ask each company, how much do you value the license? And then give the license to the one who says it values it the most. The problem is that this procedure is not likely to work very well because if companies understand that their chance of getting the license is enhanced if they quote a higher number, well then they have a strong incentive to exaggerate their values. And if all of the companies are exaggerating their values, then there is no guarantee that the company that really does value the license the most will get it. So, so this, um, this mechanism that is, is just too naive. It's not, going to, it's not going to work. The government could try something uh, a little bit more sophisticated. It could have each company make a bid for the license. A, a bid is a statement of how much you're willing to pay. Each company could make a bid, and the there we go. Uh, and the license can be awarded to the high bidder. That that's the the natural uh, determination of uh, who wins, and the um, high bidder pays its bid. What I've just now described is what's called a high bid auction. And it's, it's a, a, an auction which is frequently used for all sorts of purposes. Let's suppose that it's used for privatizing this license. Well, it, it's, it's better than the first mechanism that I mentioned. The first mechanism gives all the bidders an incentive to exaggerate their bids, to overstate their bids. Uh, in the high bid auction, bidders are not going to overstate because if, if the license is worth uh, 10 million to me, I'm not going to bid 12 million because if I win, I'll have to pay 12 million and that's too much. So, so companies will not overbid in this, in this mechanism. Uh, unfortunately, they will underbid. They will understate. And, and, and let me explain why. So, so imagine that you're a, a telecom company. Let's call you Telemax. And let's suppose that the license is worth $10 million to you. Well, if you bid $10 million and you win, you'll be getting something worth $10 million, but you'll be paying $10 million, and so your net profit will be zero. You might as well not have bothered to participate in the mechanism at all. Uh, so you're, you're, you're not going to uh, bid the full amount, 10 million, you're going to bid something less, maybe 8 million or 7 million. Of course, bidding less reduces your chance of winning, but at least if you do win, you'll make a nice positive profit. So, so Telemax and all of the other companies will now be understating, underbidding, and once again, there's no guarantee 
that the winner, the, the high bidder, will be the company that actually values the license the most. So this mechanism, it's better than the first, but it's still not good enough. And we might ask, well, is there any mechanism that will work? Is there any mechanism that strikes exactly the right balance between overstatements and understatements? And it turns out that there is such a mechanism. Um, it was discovered, it's, it's not thousands of years old, it was actually discovered about 50 years ago by uh, the American economist William Vickery. Uh, and for that reason, it's, it's sometimes called the Vickery mechanism. As you'll see, it's extremely simple, but uh, extraordinarily clever. I, I, I think it's even cl more clever than the, uh, than the divide and choose method. Um, and here's how it works. It, it looks a lot like the mechanism I just showed you. It looks a lot like the high bid auction, but there's a twist. So once again, every company makes a bid for the license. And once again, the winner is the high bidder. But now, instead of paying its own bid, the winner pays the second highest bid. So that means that if there are three bidders and one bids 10 million, one bids 8 million, a third bids 5 million, the winner will be the 10 million bidder, that's the high bid, but it will pay only 8 million because that's the second highest bid. So I, I claim that this mechanism solves the government's problem. This mechanism will achieve an efficient outcome. The license will go to the company that has the highest, that truly has the highest value. Now, um, why is that? Well, I, I first have to convince you that companies no longer have an incentive to understate. And the reason they don't have an incentive to understate is that they don't pay their bid anyway. If the license is worth 10 million to me, and I bid 9 million, let's imagine that the second highest bid is 8 million, I, w I don't gain anything by, uh, by bidding 9 million. I still pay 8 million if I win. So bidding 9 million or 10 million results in the same outcome, I win, and in the same payment, I pay 8 million. So, so the underbidding uh, doesn't reduce my payment at all. Uh, furthermore, there's a big risk to underbidding, which is I might end up losing the license altogether. If I bid, say, 7 million, and someone else has bid 8 million, I will be out in the cold. I, I, I'll, I'll lose the license altogether, and I'll be kicking myself because if I had only bid 10 million, what it's really worth to me, I would have won, and I would have had a nice 2 million profit, 10 million minus 8 million. So I certainly don't want to underbid. Um, it never, it's never to my advantage, and it might, it might be a disaster if I, if I underbid. And for similar reasons, I don't want to overbid. S suppose, suppose that it's worth 10 million to me and I bid 12 million. Well, if the second highest bid is less than 10 million, my bidding 12 million makes no difference at all. Bid 10 million, 12 million, I win either way and I pay whatever the second highest bid is. So uh, overbidding has no consequence if the second highest bid is below my true value. <coughs> but suppose that um, somebody else has bid 11 million. Well now, by having bid 12, 12 million, I will win, but 
I don't want to win because I, I have to pay $11 million and that's too much. The license is only worth $10 million to me. So if I overbid, I run the risk of overpaying. Uh, so I don't want to overbid. We already saw that I don't want to underbid. The optimal strategy for a company in this mechanism is to bid exactly what the license is worth to me. I don't want to overstate, I don't want to understate. But if every company is bidding exactly what the license is worth to it, the winner will indeed be the company with the highest value. And that's what the government wanted to accomplish in the first place. And so, again, we have solved the mechanism designer's problem. We have implemented the mechanism designer's goals. Let me give you one more example. Um, and you'll notice that each example is getting a little bit more complicated, but uh, I don't think uh, with this audience that will po pose any great difficulties. So, so here is the, the most complicated example. Um, it's a... Um, it's an energy example. Um, it's a very um, small society that we're going to deal with. It's a, it's a society with, uh, with two people. Uh, let's call them Alice and Bob, our old friends. Uh, and these two people are, among other things, consume energy. Uh, and the mechanism designer in this, in this example will be an energy authority which has to decide on which form of energy Alice and Bob are going to consume. Let, let's suppose that it would be too costly uh, in this society to have more than one kind of energy. Uh, so the authority has to choose from, uh, has to choose one kind of energy out of uh, four possibilities. And, and the four possibilities are natural gas, oil, nuclear power, and coal. And what the authority would like to do what the authority would like to do is to make a choice which is consistent with what Alice and Bob want. That, that's, a reasonable, that's a reasonable goal for the authority to aspire to. But the problem, as usual, is that the authority doesn't know what a Alice and Bob wants. <coughs> Let's imagine, to make matters simple, that there are just two possibilities for what Alice and Bob might want. I'll call them two different states of the world. In, in one state of the world, Alice and Bob uh, don't care very much about their future consumption of energy. They, they care mainly about uh, consumption today. That's, that's state one. And in state two, we'll imagine that just the opposite is true. They, uh, they put a lot of weight on the future, not so much on current consumption. And, and, and to be a little bit more concrete about Alice and Bob's preferences, <coughs> let's suppose that Alice is a consumer who cares mostly about convenience. So uh, in, uh, in state one, if, if state one is the actual state, uh, so she's putting most of her weight on current consumption, uh, she likes gas the most. That, that's the easiest to use. Uh, and then oil, and then coal, and nuclear power is down at the bottom because nuclear power is extremely cumbersome to use. I mean, imagine trying to drive your car uh, using nuclear power. Uh, under current technology, that wouldn't be so easy. Um, so, so those are her preferences in state one. In in state two, wh where she looks ahead to the future, now nuclear power comes up to the top because she thinks that there will be technological advances which make nuclear power much easier to use, then gas, then 
coal and now oil is at the bottom. Um, <coughs> what about Bob? Well, suppose that, that Bob cares mostly about how safe an energy source is for him to use. Uh, so in, um, in state one, uh, he thinks nuclear power uh, is the safest. That's, that's where he's looking at current consumption. Uh, then oil, then coal, and he puts gas down at the bottom because he's afraid uh, that his, his gas oven might blow up. Uh, he doesn't think gas is very safe. But again, looking ahead to the future, now nuclear power goes down to the bottom because he's worried about the long-term safety issues of disposing of nuclear waste. So uh, Alice and Bob have different preferences depending on what the actual state of the world is, uh, state one or state two. And um, let me summarize their preferences by this table. So, so what this means is that if state one is the actual state, that, that is, if Alice and Bob care mostly about current consumption, then Alice ranks gas first, and then oil, then coal, nuclear power is at the bottom, and similarly for Bob, and similarly for state two. So th th this is just summarizing what I've already said. Now, the Energy Authority, as I s would like to choose a form of energy which uh, reflects what Alice and Bob wants. Of course, Alice and Bob want different things. They don't have the same preferences. And so that means that the authority is going to have to make some compromise between Alice's preferences and Bob's preferences. What is a, um, what is a good compromise in state one? Well, Gas is not a good compromise in state one because although ga Alice likes gas a lot, Bob hates gas. Gas is all the way down at the bottom. And nuclear power is not a good compromise because Bob likes nuclear best, but Alice doesn't like nuclear power at all. And coal is not a good compromise because both Alice and Bob prefer oil to coal. Alice prefers oil to coal. Bob prefers oil to coal. So that suggests that um, it's reasonable for the energy authority to have oil as its optimum, assuming that state one is true. And for for very similar reasons, I'm not going to go through the details, but the logic is, a, is exactly the same. Uh, gas is the best compromise between Alice and Bob's preferences in state two. So, so the authority wants to choose oil in state one, gas in state two, but the difficulty is that the authority doesn't know what the state is. Alice and Bob know what the state is, but the authority doesn't. So, so what can the authority do? Well, the, um, again, the, the, the simplest thing, the, the most obvious thing, would be for the authority to ask Alice and Bob what the state is. The problem is that that's not likely to get very revealing answers. Let, let me explain why. Uh, look at it from Alice's point of view. She knows that the she knows that the authority wants to choose oil in state one, gas in state two. In both states, state one and state two, Alice prefers gas to oil. She per she prefers gas to oil in state one. She prefers gas to oil in state two, she wants to make the authority believe that state two is the actual state, even if state one is the actual state. So she's always going to say state two. And Bob has the incentive 
to say state one because Bob always prefers oil to gas. He prefers oil to gas in state one. He prefers oil to gas in state two. He wants to make the authority believe that state one is the actual state. So Bob will say state one. Alice will say state two. And the poor authority will have no idea what the actual state is. So, so asking Alice and Bob, doing a survey, is not going to work. And you might ask, well, what does work? Well, I'll, sh I'll show you what works. That works. Now, you, you might ask, what is that? Well, so, some of you have uh, probably been exposed to game theory. And what this is, is a game matrix or game table, uh, same as you would see in, in game theory. The idea is that uh, in this game, in, the, in this mechanism, Alice chooses rows. She can choose the top row or the bottom row. And Bob chooses columns. He can choose the left column or the right column. And then the outcome is just the intersection of their choices. So, so if Alice chooses the bottom row and Bob chooses the left column, the outcome is nuclear power. Well, suppose that, we, suppose that the authority has Alice and Bob play this play this mechanism. What will happen? Well, what will happen will depend on which is the actual state. Now, remember, Alice and Bob know what the state is. The authority doesn't. Let's suppose that um, state one is the actual state. What will Alice and Bob do? Well, let's first look at it from Alice's point of view. If Alice predicts that Bob is going to choose the left column, then she wants to choose the top row. Because if she chooses the top row, she gets oil. If she chooses the bottom row, she gets nuclear power. And notice that in state one, which is the state we're talking about, Alice prefers oil to nuclear power. So if, if she thinks Bob is going to go left, she will choose the top row. Furthermore, Bob will indeed have a strong incentive to choose the left column. Actually, that holds regardless of what he thinks Alice is going to do. Uh, notice that um, if Alice... If he thinks Alice is going to choose the top row, he's better off going left because he gets oil rather than coal. And notice that Bob prefers oil to coal in state one. But even if, even if he thinks that Alice is going to choose the bottom row, he's better off going left because if he goes left, he will get nuclear power. If he goes right, he will get gas. And in state one, Bob prefers nuclear power to gas. So this analysis tells us that we, we can expect, the mechanism designer can expect that in state one, Alice will choose the top row and Bob will choose the left column. And notice that when that happens, the outcome is oil, which is exactly what the authority wanted to happen in state one. To use the language of game theory, Alice choosing top, Bob playing left, is a Nash equilibrium. A Nash equilibrium is a configuration of strategies where each player, Bob and Alice, are maximizing their preferences given what the other player is doing. Uh, Nash equilibrium, for those of you who don't know game theory, is named 
after John Nash, who was the first, the first person to generally formulate this concept. You may uh, have heard about him because the, he's the hero of the movie A Beautiful Mind. Many of you may have seen that. It, uh, the reason that movie was made was because Nash became famous for his scientific work, and, and he also had great personal difficulties in his life, which he, over, which he overcame to do that work. Um, but one of his major accomplishments was formulating Nash equilibrium. So we, we see that in state one, uh, we get the right outcome, uh, the right Nash equilibrium uh, from this mechanism. We get oil. And I'm not going to go through the details for state two. Uh, you might like to check them yourselves just to make sure your understanding is... Uh, uh, is okay, uh, but if you go through the same kind of argument I did for state one, you'll see that in state two, there again is a Nash equilibrium in which Alice wants to play the bottom row and Bob wants to choose the right column and now the outcome is gas. And gas is exactly what the energy authority, the mechanism designer, wants in state two. So this, me this little mechanism indeed solves the problem. It implements the, uh, the energy authority's goals. Okay, well, I, I've shown you three examples. Um, cake example, telecom example, energy example. I could have shown you many others. You may not be entirely satisfied with my presentation because there's a sense in which uh, I've been acting a little like a magician. That is, there's a problem and I pull a rabbit out of my hat, I pull a mechanism out of my hat, and you have no idea how I knew, how I found that mechanism in the first place. There's, there's literally an infinity of possible mechanisms that you could use for any of these problems. How did I know what just the right mechanism to use was? If, if that bothers you, uh, I'm with you. <laughs> Uh, so, I admit that th this presentation was, was too much case-oriented. Uh, I, I didn't really um, show you the general principles for finding mechanisms. You, mechanisms. you might ask, well, is there a general way of determining whether a mechanism designer's goals are achievable or not? That in the three examples, it turned out that the goals were achievable, and I showed you a mechanism for, for uh, reaching that goal. But um, not all goals can be attained. Uh, I can give you plenty of other examples where uh, we fall short of, of the goal. We necessarily fall short of the goal we would like to attain. Is there a way of determining when we can achieve a goal when we can't? And if we can achieve a goal, is there a way of uh, building a mechanism? Is there a recipe we can follow, an algorithm we can follow for constructing that mechanism? Well, um, the answer to both those questions turns out to be yes. Don't worry, I'm not going to go into the details of why the answer is yes today. It, it, it would take a bit too long, but if you want to do some extra reading, you might want to take a look at this old paper of mine in which um, it's shown uh, uh, quite carefully 
why the answer to both questions is yes. Um, and it, it was trying to figure out why the answer was yes that actually pulled me into this field, the field of mechanism design in the first place. I, I wanted to know the, those answers, and it was a lot of fun uh, uh, trying to find them. Um, but just to conclude uh, my presentation this morning, let me mention a few um, problems for the future. At, as Rubens mentioned it in, in the introduction, uh, mechanism design is probably going to become even more important in the future. Uh, mechanism design formally has been around now for, for 50 years or so. I, I told you about the Vickrey mechanism. That was part of the beginning. There was also some work by uh, Leo Hurwitz, which, which uh, got the subject going. So it's been alive and well for 50 years, but there's a sense in which its best, its best days may be yet to come. And, and let me mention a couple of problems uh, not yet solved, which uh, will probably be ultimately be solved by mechanism design. Uh, one of them is, is a biggie, uh, climate change. We're, we're all aware of the climate change issue. Uh, we're, we're aware that the, that the Earth is actually heating up, and we're aware that we're responsible for that, uh, or at least partially responsible, by emitting greenhouse gases, uh, in particular carbon dioxide. And there's an obvious solution to the problem, which is to, uh, for countries to reduce their carbon emissions. The problem is that um, there is very little incentive for each country to do that on its own. Why? Because each country uh, is much better off if the other countries reduce their emissions while uh, this country doesn't, uh, doesn't do so at all. It's costly to make reductions in carbon emissions. You have to uh, switch to non-carbon technologies. You have to shut down factories. You, ha you, you may have to uh, uh, adopt uh, more, efficient, uh, more efficient machinery. It's, uh, it's an expensive process, and everybody benefits um, if carbon is reduced, but all other things being equal, you would rather have the other countries make the reductions, not you. You want the other countries to bear the cost of reduction, not your country. So, so how, do we, how do we solve the problem of no country having, having an incentive to make carbon reductions. We solved the problem by designing a treaty in which co the countries of the world, or at least most countries of the world, pledge th that uh, e each country pledges that it will make carbon reductions if the other countries keep up their end of the bargain. But what is an international treaty? It's a mechanism. It's, it's a rule for uh, what countries do, how much they have to um, abate emissions, what, they, what compensation that perhaps they receive for, for making these abatements. Uh, which countries make abatements first. The, the, the treaty is exactly uh, a mechanism in the same sense that the divide and choose 
procedure is a mechanism or the, or the VICRI mechanism is a mechanism. Designing uh, a, tr a treaty is an exercise in mechanism design. Now, we don't yet know um, what that mechanism will be. This is an unsolved problem. Um, perhaps some of you will contribute to the solution. I hope so. Uh, <coughs> but when a solution is found, and I'm confident that it will be found, mechanism design will certainly uh, contribute significantly to that, to that solution. So that's, so that's one big problem. Um, another issue which, which I'm um, uh, particular, th th this, is, this is one of my pet projects, which is uh, improving the way that presidents are elected. Uh, and here what I have in mind, well, where it, it, in Brazil, um, you use a, um, a runoff system. Um, so in the first round, there are however many candidates there are. Uh, and if, if some candidate gets a majority in the, in the first round, then that candidate is elected, but what often happens is no candidate is elected, and then there's a runoff between the, the top two candidates, uh, and whoever wins the runoff it becomes president. That may sound like a reasonable method, uh, but it can lead to very perverse outcomes. And in fact, uh, there was a very perverse outcome in France, which uses the same method. Uh, about, uh, about a dozen years ago, uh, there were three candidates there uh, who, uh, who stood a serious chance of attracting votes. Um, one was uh, Jacques Chirac, who was president at the time. One was Lionel Jospin, who was a uh, prominent challenger uh, to Chirac's left, and then there was a far-right candidate named Le Pen. Uh, everyone thought that there would be a runoff between Chirac and, and Jospin. Tho those were the two mainstream candidates. But in the first round, it turned out that Chirac got the most votes, but Le Pen, the, the extremist from the right, right got the second uh, most votes, and that's because the vote on the left was split between Jospin and, uh, and several other candidates. Any one of those left-wing candidates would have beaten Le Pen in a head-to-head -head contest, but because they were all running against each other, their vote got split up, and, and Le Pen uh, was the one who got into the runoff, which was, which was a shocking outcome. That, uh, uh, people in France were scratching their heads. How could th this extremist, Le Pen, have got into the runoff of the French election? Well, that's because the method of electing presidents itself had some serious design flaws. It allowed the, the vote between similar candidates to get split, and so some third candidate, in this, Le, in this case Le Pen, who would never win uh, in, a, in, a, in any head-to-head -head contest, to advance. <coughs> well, this is not the time to get into the way of solving that problem. Uh, but if, if you want to ask in question time, I, I have a solution to the, uh, to the uh, problem of electing uh, president, uh, presidential candidates. Uh, one third application, which I won't get into, but which has also been uh, of interest to me is uh, stopping financial crises. Uh, financial crises uh, can be stopped or at least reduced in magnitude uh, with proper regulation. There was, not, there was not proper regulation in 2007, 2008. Uh, in particular, financial institutions were allowed to take on far too much leverage they were allowed to borrow 
too much of other people's money and invested in risky loans than was good for the system. A good regulatory system must limit leverage, but designing such a system uh, is, once again, an exercise in mechanism design. We don't have the optimal regulatory system yet, but we will. And uh, with that optimistic remark, let me stop and thank you for your attention. And I think we're going to have some, some Q&A. Shall, shall I sit here? Okay. I, I wonder if I could have some, some water, please. Oh, there is water. Okay. Thank you very much. I wonder if uh, you would be kind enough to have a version of this problem published in Portuguese before 2014, October. <laughs> that may be helpful to us. So now we have uh, up to 20 minutes for questions. And uh, please, I would like those who would like to pose questions to Eric to raise uh, their hands and pick up the microphone, identify themselves. We have a first uh, question here in the first row. Na primeira fila, por favor. Hello. Uh, my name is Sergio Rottenberg. And what I'd like is uh, if Mr. Maskin could, in a few words, tell us a little bit of the subject he didn't come into. You know, how to get to the mechanism designed to work. I I if it's possible, yep. in a few words. So, so what I did in that 1977 paper was to uh, first of all uh, formulate what it means to have a goal uh, in a in a precise way. Actually, that I, I didn't do that. That that was that that was work that was that was previously done by Hurwitz. So so what what is a goal uh, in a in a precise uh, in a precise sense, it's a. It can be uh, expressed mathematically. It's a function, which takes uh, states of the world into outcomes. So, for a, a, a state of the world describes the preferences that people have. Different states of the world correspond to different preferences that those people could have. And for each state of the world, the function singles out the outcome which is optimal in that state. So, so in the uh, energy example, there were two states of the world. And in one, in, in one state, gas was optimal. And in the other state, oil was optimal, and so the, func uh, the, the, the function that that the that the mechanism just is this working? Yes. Uh, the, the the function that the mechanism designer wanted to implement uh, mapped state one into oil and state two into gas. Uh, so what I did was to first identify. Uh, what property of that goal, of that function, would have to be satisfied for us to be able to find a mecha a any mechanism uh, uh, to work? Uh, what, what, uh, 
what property has to be satisfied for the mechanism design problem to be solvable. And it turns out uh, <coughs> that the mechanism has to satisfy what's, what's called a, uh, the, the property of monotonicity. Uh, in other words, if, if an outcome goes up in people's preferences, if, if, we, if, if in going from one state to another an outcome goes up in people's preferences, uh, then uh, it shouldn't go down as far as the uh, mechanism designer is concerned. If, if, it, if it was optimal before, it should remain optimal once it's gone up even farther up in people's preferences. <coughs> Given that, uh, so if that condition is satisfied, we can find a mechanism. If it's not satisfied, there's no mechanism which will implement the goal. Now, given a goal that satisfies monotonicity, uh, the, the paper also uh, constructs a, um, a mechanism which implement the goal. And, and uh, the, the way it does so is to uh, look at, at three different cases. So, so, so uh, uh, in the mechanism, people are now announcing states. So, so said that, that a mechanism designer constructs a game. When you construct a game, you have to say what the strategies, the strategies that people can choose are. Let's suppose that the strategies that they can choose are to announce states. That, that's a that possibility. If they all announce the same states, uh, then... Um, the outcome is the optimal, what the goal says should be the, the right outcome for that, for that state. Of course, the mechanism designer doesn't know whether that's the state or not. Uh, but my, my sound seems to be fluctuating a bit. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe I should switch to... Maybe this is better. Okay. So um, the mechanism design, uh, the, the, the mechanism is first designed what happens if everyone announces the same strategy. You have to make sure that, uh, that, they, that people have the incentive to announce the right state. And so you have to design the mechanism in such a way that uh, if they announce the state Falsely, they do worse. Uh, that's where this condition of monotonicity comes in. Uh, uh, you, you, can, you can construct the mechanism, give people the right incentives if monotonicity is satisfied. If they, uh, if they don't, if monotonicity is not satisfied, there's no mechanism that will work. Okay, so, so I, maybe I've already... Uh, exhausted <laughs> uh, the audience's attention on that point, but I hope that at least gives you a flavor of um, how, uh, how you go about uh, constructing mechanisms in, in theory. There was some, somebody else. Professor Marskin, thank you very much. The talk was uh, very interesting, and uh, I am really impressed in the social impact this can have. I am Eduardo Gomesoro. I'm a medicine doctor and a physician. I come from the pharmaceutical industry, and I am a student in the uh, executive master in business administration. Uh, the point I would like to ask you is, uh, concerning your second example, uh, it's in... It's really interesting to have a more fair way to, to, uh, to, to know which company is going to sell drugs for the government, for instance, and or which are going to be uh, partners in uh, uh, government in initiatives on health care and etc. Uh, the point of getting the bids higher is quite clear, but the point about not going too low 
or damping them is not so clear because in my view if the the market